Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna finish out with Inkscape today. Hey Matteo, hey Cohen. Um, and that's just that's not gonna take the entire class. Um, but we are going to basically after that's done, we're going to talk about getting your Raspberry Pi set up in time for Monday. And that's fantastic. Yeah, um, everybody has pretty strong opinions about Inkscape. The thing is, you can do cool things with Inkscape, but it's such a it's such a finicky program, and you you really have to know what you're doing with it in order to get a lot out of it. You know, you, you have to be like a graphics artist or or you know somebody who's really into like laser cutting and stuff like that. So <clears throat> opinions tend to be fairly divided on Inkscape, although generally leaning in one direction over another. <sighs> Oh, well, yeah, there's that too. Once you've gone over it once, you're not exactly thrilled to be going over it again. But yeah, so we're gonna we're basically just gonna spend some time talking about some of the stuff you can do with uh, Inkscape. And that'll probably be about 20-ish minutes while I ramble on and on and on. And it's also gonna involve, you know, just spending a little bit of time talking about this stuff. And then, uh, you know, we're probably gonna go off on a tangent or two. But after uh, after that time, uh, we're gonna go over getting your Raspberry Pi set up just so you guys know how to get everything plugged in. And uh, then we'll once once everybody's got everything set up, we'll just be done for the day. So it might end up being a fairly short day today, but then you guys will be prepped and ready to go for Monday when we start doing Raspberry Pi stuff. And that's gonna be really cool. That's gonna be really neat. All right. So I went over 3D printing your vector graphic uh, uh, last Wednesday. And Mr. Dubica went over parametric design with you guys on Monday. So you guys got to learn all about parametric design, which is a very, very useful tool. It's great. Um, so you can think of Inkscape in that sense, almost like a like a 2D CAD program, which is kind of a uh, a misnomer. It's kind of a redundancy. It's kind of incorrect, but at the same time, it kind of makes sense. But anyway. Um, Parametric design uh, basically gives you a lot of control over the uh, the specifics on what you're designing, the size of everything and how it all fits together, and it provides a uh, a, a consistency across your entire project. You know, he went over the clone function uh, versus the duplicate function versus the copy and paste function. Again, um, very useful for for uh, designing larger projects that require some, uh, at least a modicum of precision. So that's that's what that's useful for. Parametric design is great for designing something to tight specifications or tight parameters, hence the name parametric design. Oh my goodness. Um, and, uh, you know, so you basically got exposed to all of that, which is, is uh, it's an interesting thing. All right. So yeah, we'll just we'll do a little bit of review over what I went over on Wednesday. Not the raster or not the vectorizing a raster image, but just sort of the things that you can do with vector graphics. Um, so to start, you can 3D print them, but you guys already knew that. But it's a super easy process in case you didn't. You just take an SVG file. It has to be an SVG file. That is what vector images are. They're SVG files, short for scalable vector graphic, I believe. Um, and you take that SVG file. It's generally got to be like a single path. And then you import that SVG of a single path into Tinkercad. And once you've done that, it will automatically be three-dimensional, and then you can futz around with the um, with the uh, dimensions and stuff like that there. Uh, I want to say like two, maybe three years ago, probably three years ago at this point, good Lord. Um, three years ago, we were doing this. We were, we were vectorizing an image, and then we were taking a single scan of that image, or a single path. We were bringing it, bringing it into Tinkercad, and then using it to create an embossed face on like a coin. So you'd have like a little 3D printed coin, 
that had a um that had an embossed design on it of your choosing which was actually kind of cool uh i know that the people in the class then were pretty stoked about it um you know maybe you guys have moved on to bigger and better things and that's just that's just super passe at this point but i thought that was pretty neato <laughs> So that's one thing you can do with it. And then of course you got to export it to an STL file and then and then uh, <clears throat> import that STL file into your 3D printer driver and then you can print something. Then they got the uh, Bezier tool, Bezier tool. I don't know. I don't know if I'm just sounding like a pretentious snob by saying it's Bezier. It's actually Bezier. Um, but yeah, you know, I also tend to mispronounce the absolute anything out of anything. Um, so I, I think in, in that sense, I'm also second guessing myself. I'm thinking it's probably Bezier, but then I, I'm wrong so so often. Oh yes, no, Bezier. Um, it's that it's that blue blood in me. Yes, let's go boating out on the weekend. No. Oh. Anyway, um, no, the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi is actually going to start on Monday. However, at the end of class today, uh, which could end pretty early, we're going to spend time getting it set up so that you guys are prepped and ready to go for Monday. So this is this is the last bit of Inkscape, and then we're going to dive into Raspberry Pi next week. But again, I am going to make sure that you guys are able to get your Raspberry Pis set up today. And ready to go. But yeah, so <clears throat> Bezier tool, uh, great for creating nice uh, outlines of raster images so that you have sort of a vectorized outline of it. As you can see, you can get a fair amount of detail in it, like this little, uh, the puppy, the puppy. Business cards is another one. Uh, one year we did a, uh, I think that was last year, actually. We did business cards. Um, reaction to that was mixed. Like I said, Inkscape tends to be a pretty controversial set of lessons. But, hey, you know, whatever. I'm the boss right now, so we have to do what I say. Yeah. That's that's how this is going to go down. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know. Um, business cards. Night. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... I I think I remember that. Um, but yeah, business cards are neat because you can do all kinds of cool things with them in order to make your business stand out among all the rest. For instance, that little uh, laser cut business card allows you to build a giraffe from uh, different parts. And I think it's for like a zookeeper or something. I don't remember. Anyway, then you got this Brola Loca. Brola Loco? Brola Loco? I can't tell if those are A's or O's. Bro, bro, lo loco, broca loco. Maybe that's a C instead of a an L. <sighs> also, make sure that your font is readable when you make it. Broco loco. Anyway, the design is cool. It's got a neato cutout bit that makes it look real neat. You can tell that because of the way it is. So yeah, one year we made our own business cards. Um, and you could, you know, then get them uh, cut out in lab and stuff like that and get the nice get the nice engraving on them and everything. And it was it was a cool idea. But again, we've moved on to bigger and better things. Raspberry Pi, for instance. No. No. This is how you do it. You make a box, you fill it, and then put stuff in it and do all kinds of stuff. All right, <clears throat> GitHub. Now, why might this say GitHub? Well, that's because, in particular, uh, this was referencing a script that you could download off of GitHub in order to convert your Inkscape SVG file into an OpenSCAD file, which is a which is a uh, computer-assisted design program uh, in order to export that to be 3D printed. So you could do a whole lot more um, 
uh, customization with the 3D version of that and everything. You didn't have to rely on putting it in Tinkercad. So that's why it says GitHub. But I wanted to take a moment to talk about GitHub because it's fantastic. GitHub is super fantastic. Git is fantastic. You know, if you ever go into coding, version control is your friend. And I don't just mean a whole bunch of different folders on your desktop that say, no, they're really, though, this is the final version. This one works, I swear. Uh, that's not going to fly after a while. Anyway, that was my moment to talk about Git and GitHub. <coughs> so you convert it to a, an OpenSCAD format. You import it into OpenSCAD. Download it, install OpenSCAD, import it. Then you get to compile and render it. And then you can do all sorts of neato, wacky stuff with it. I'm just going to say neato a lot now. <laughs> One of my middle school students freaked out over this fact that I said neato. And so I started saying it a lot more uh, just because I could. Uh, I know, I'm a terrible person. And uh, now I'm just saying neato all the time. That is going to be the word du jour, perhaps the word de month. Um, and if so, I preemptively apologize. But anyway. Nito is a great word. I'm glad you see. I'm glad you see the light. Nito is a fantastic word. <laughs> nice, or nice, I guess. All right. So yeah. So that's that's 3D printing it. You can also laser cut it. Mew, 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 mew. That was the sound of lasers, in case you weren't aware. Um, I know I do an incredibly convincing laser sound, but sometimes I just need to explain it a little bit more. It's just how it goes. Anyway, laser noises. Uh, laser cutting your vector graphic. Because laser cutting and vector images are just hand in hand. Well, I, they they need to they need to actually get like a better uh, they need to get a better transformer because it's not supplying constant power, and so it's just throttling all the time. Hence the mew 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 mew. Uh, also, it might be a cat. I don't really know. Anyway, um, laser cutting vector graphics go together hand in hand. Why well, you might ask? Well, uh, things like <laughs> cool beans, awesome. <laughs> You might hear me say uh, gnarly a fair amount too. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, vector graphics, or uh, let's do this, let's do this. Laser cutting, 3D printing, STL files, buzzwords. No, these things are simply um, sets of coordinates that tell the 3D printer, laser cutter, whatever, to move to this position next. That's all they are. They're just saying, hey, you're gonna start at like, 1-1, one, one, and then you're going to go to 1-2, then you're going to go to 2-1, and then you're going to go to 2-2, then you're going to go, you know, 1-0, uh, and then you're going to go to 0-1, you know, and, and, and it's just, you're just telling it to move to specific points in an imaginary grid that exists on the 3D printer or the laser cutter canvas. So you guys have gone through algebra. You're well familiar with the y equals 3x plus y, or you know, 6 or whatever, um, and all of its variant and more complex forms, all the way up to perhaps some form of calculus and things like that. And you know that these equations can start to get pretty complex, but at their base, all they are are a set of coordinates that represent a line or uh, a shape or whatever. Well, that's the basis behind vector graphics. Vector graphics are mathematical equations. They're, they're graphics represented by mathematical equations. So think of the easiest way to get an x and a y coordinate if you only have one of them. Uh, well, you just plug it into your equation and then you get the result. Computers are really super good at doing that. So the fact that a vector graphic, its entire point huh, is to create a set of coordinates um, based on, you know, input points and a laser cutter or a 3D printer, its entire point, I'm sorry, is to draw something based on a set of coordinates or points. You can see where the two really work together well. You just dump a whole bunch of X coordinates 
or y coordinates or whatever you just dump a whole bunch of uh, inputs into your vector graphic and then you get the resultant outputs and you pair them together input and output and then you've suddenly got a set of coordinates for your 3d printer or laser cutter just like that like, like natural doesn't have to do any sort of weird math or anything like that to, to figure out where the, the colors exist on a particular image, like when we try to do the trace bitmap thing. It doesn't have to, to deal with any sort of explicit, uh, you know, coding done by a human being in order to get the, the exact precise coordinates or anything. It just, it just takes your information and it goes, okay, now I have a set of coordinates. I'm going to do this. Boom, done. So they work together really well. This is creating a spiral graph. And I think that this little tutorial is hilarious because it starts out with draw your gear, draw the rest of the spiral graph, done. Which is immensely helpful. <laughs> like, wow, thanks. Um, so, you know, this part's a little light on the how to actually create a spirograph part. How many of you are familiar with spirographs, by the way? Because th those things were sort of becoming passe by the time I was hitting, like, middle school and stuff like that. So it might be that spirographs are long gone now and the weird, archaic relic of the past that's inscrutable and you don't understand how it works. Or it could just be that you guys were using spirographs in elementary school. You have one. Okay, so pff, there you go. You use one. All right, your brother has one. Boom. Okay, so yeah, there you go. You guys know exactly what a spirograph is. Well, you could you could uh, you could create your own spirograph in Inkscape, and then send it to a laser cutter so that the laser cutter cuts out your sweet custom spirograph. Just pretty neato. But yeah, these are just some of the examples of things that you can do with um, with uh, laser cutters. 3D printers and Inkscape. So even though you might be sitting here going like, "Ugh, I hate Inkscape," or "Ugh, we've been using Inkscape for the last four years," or "Ugh, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why anybody would use Inkscape," you know that whole like, "Why would anybody use this math thing? Why would anybody use Inkscape?" Well, I'll tell you, this is why. So anyway, now that I've proven my points, um, not really, I've just yelled at you until I said I proved my points. Uh, let's talk about getting your Raspberry Pis set up. So everybody, when you got your Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi 3, Let's see here. See if we can't get an image of all of the different stuffs. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in on this image. Man, if you want to talk about raster versus vector. All right, so everybody when they got their Raspberry Pi, oh you're at the beach, but you set up a few weeks ago. All right, excellent. So well, then you can head out. Don't tell anybody else. But if you've already got it, if you guys already have your Raspberry Pi set up, you can go. But if you're not sure, or if you definitely haven't set up, set it up with me right now. But otherwise, yeah, if you know what you're doing, if you've already done it, don't sweat it. Head out. Have a great weekend. For those of you who are staying, though, your Raspberry Pi kit probably came with a few things. All right, see you later, Jean-Marc. Oh, you can do it with ease. All right, well, as long as you're absolutely confident in that, you don't have another monitor to set it up with. Eh. Okay, that does make things a little tricky. See you later, Mate uh, see you later Mateo. Um, do you have... Yeah, you can use your TV. That's totally fine. As long as your TV's got like an HDMI hookup, you can totally use your TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you would have gotten this bit right here, which is the Raspberry Pi proper. You would have gotten this bit right here, which is a, an SD card. Oh, you already have? Okay, excellent. Well, have a good one. Have a great weekend, and uh, good luck on your homework.
<laughs> All right, no problem, Caleb. Have a good one. <laughs> All right, so like, so like a third of the class so far has already got their setup. That's excellent. That's excellent. It's a nice short class today, then. Oh yeah, no, no, no worries. All right, no worries. Yeah, it's um, I appreciate that also. You know, the 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 kind of thing where you read the instruction manual just in case, anyway. Um. All right, see you later, Josh. Yeah, you know what you're doing too. Yeah, if you've been using it for a year, you know what you're doing. All right, see you later, Hannah. Have a good weekend. <laughs> okay, so back to the thing at hand. You should probably have your Raspberry Pi and a micro, or well, uh, an SD card. And that SD card is going to contain your operating system, your, you know, your 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 kernel, basically everything that you need in order to get it running. Um, it's also going to be your sole storage for anything that you're running with. So if you install something on your Raspberry Pi, you're installing it onto this this boy right here. So that's one of the advantages of the Raspberry Pi is you can have a couple of those. And you can yank out one, obviously, while it's off, and then swap it out with another one. And suddenly your Raspberry Pi has an entirely different operating system, entirely different hard drive. You know, computers could only dream to have that much modularity unless they're servers, in which case they do. But then that also comes with a 15-minute startup time. Anyway, um, so... Raspberry Pi, SD card, the things that you will need, you probably got a power source. Excellent, you'll need that as well. Uh, you'll need an HDMI, you'll need some sort of display, uh, and you'll need some USB cables or some USB peripherals, at least. You're probably gonna want a keyboard and a mouse that you can plug into your uh, Raspberry Pi. It says that you can pair your Raspberry Pi with your PC via Bluetooth. What will that actually do? Uh, that's an excellent question because I believe that's a function that exists that's new to the three. Uh, I do not believe that my two has Bluetooth functionality. If it does, then, well, it certainly won't be the last time that I'm wrong. Um, but that's an excellent question. Actually, uh, let's see here. Raspberry Pi 3 Bluetooth. No, uh, Bluetooth doesn't send enough information uh, to do like video like that, unfortunately. And you would need to install um, you would need to install a, a, a package in order to get Bluetooth functionality. But okay, it looks like you can do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so this guy hooked it up to a Bluetooth speaker. Um, I'm sure you could probably get it hooked up to like a Bluetooth mouse. So you'd always have keyboard control, but then through the terminal, you can enable Bluetooth functionality, go into the GUI, and you have a mouse, a wireless mouse, um, connected, sending information. Potentially. Potentially. Perhaps. Perhaps a mente. Remains to be seen. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. You will need USB peripherals as well, keyboard and mouse. Thankfully, setting up a Bluetooth, really super easy, really easy. So blue, or, um, or sorry, setting up a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi 3 SD slot. Just so I can get a, a good picture of where that SD card slot exists on it. So it's on, that's, that's an, there we go. This is broken. It should not look like this. It should look like this. 
let me get rid of all my drawings. It should look like this, where it's it's underneath the thing. But see, this is the bottom of the Raspberry Pi. So what you do is you take your SD card and you just plug it into that slot on the bottom of your Raspberry Pi. All right, <laughs> have a great one, William. Enjoy your weekend. Um, but you set it up on the bottom of your Raspberry Pi. You plug in the USB peripherals, you plug in the monitor, and then you plug your Raspberry Pi into power. So you got your USB peripherals, you've got your HDMI for a monitor, and you've got your uh, you got your power, which is a micro USB. But make sure whatever you do, whatever you do, you plug in the power last. Because here's what at least historically, a Raspberry Pi is done. A Raspberry Pi is part of its boot process detects what's plugged into it. Because a Raspberry Pi can technically be run uh, like headless. You know, no monitor, no keyboard, no mouse. Uh, just basically doing something and sending commands through the internet to somewhere else or serving as a small media server or whatever. But the thing is, it's part of its modularity. So part of its boot process is it detects what's plugged into it. And if something's not plugged in, say, for instance, on the video outputs, it's not going to start up the, uh, the, uh, the graphics handler. It's, not gonna, it's basically not going to power up the video outputs. So if you start plugging stuff into your Raspberry Pi after it's been turned on, you might go like, oh, no, like none of this is working. What's going wrong? Like my keyboard isn't working or, you know, I'm not getting any output on my monitor or, you know, whatever. No, no, no. It's okay. Just unplug your Raspberry Pi, plug it back in with all of that stuff plugged in. And it should boot up everything. Then once it's done with that, oh, you got a micro SD on the Raspberry Pi 3. Oh, I see. Well, isn't that fancy? Um, so yeah, you want to plug in the, the micro SD into the little socket on the bottom. I have not yet seen a Raspberry Pi 3 in person. Uh, so obviously I'm going to make rookie mistakes like that. But yeah, so it's really super easy. Just plug everything in, then plug your power in, and uh, let it go through the boot up process. So give it a try if you can. If not, write down the process. Give it a test, you know, get it get it up and running before Monday, and uh, then you should be good to go. Um, but if you've if you've got it handy right now and you've got everything else, no reason not to uh, to try to get it set up right now. And uh, if you've either gotten it written down or set up. You can uh, you can let me know and then uh, head on out. Awesome. Yeah, you should see like the 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 command line starting to run and stuff like that, and then you'll probably get sent into a GUI. I don't I don't know. It's Raspbian, but it's been a minute since I've used Raspbian. Okay, so that's an interesting question. Can you use the Raspberry Pi on a laptop? It's like a small computer of its own. So that's 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 sort of like asking, can I use my computer on my laptop? And that's not to that's not meant to like be uh you know. It's not a it's not a bad question, but I think uh, uh, answering that question is. Understanding the Raspberry Pi is crucial to answering that question, and it is it is like its own its own computer. Uh, so when you when you um, plug in like a keyboard and stuff like that, it's because it, you're setting it up like a regular desktop computer. Now, eventually, what you can do is after you've gotten the Raspberry Pi set up and on your home network, you can actually use your laptop to 
to uh, remote into it. And then, yes, you could use your Raspberry Pi, or excuse me, you could use your laptop to control your Raspberry Pi. And that's totally doable. But it does require some initial setup um, before you get it basically hooked up through your network that you would need to, um, you would need to uh, essentially do manually. Does that answer your question? Really? All right, awesome, cool. Glad to glad to hear it. I I started to kind of ramble and and talk in circles, and so that that's part of the reason why I wanted to make sure. Oh, that's awesome because I cannot easily hook it up to my home network. I have a Raspberry Pi 2 in my hands right now. Um, oh, welcome back, Cohen. Um, I have a Raspberry Pi 2 in my hands right now, and this needs to be wired. It does not have wireless capabilities. So if I can get a Raspberry Pi 3 and get it hooked up to my network wirelessly, that would be wonderful. How's everybody doing on the setup, by the way? Everything going well? I'm also going to stop recording the session because really at this point, it's just sort of uh, a conversation as opposed to a lecture. And so it doesn't really need to be recorded. But yes, for those of you watching at home, have a wonderful weekend. And, uh, you know, yeah.